They're coming to get you, Barbara. His films have horrified audiences since 1968. I slept with the light on after seeing Night of the Living Dead for the first time. It just paralyzed me with fear. His name brings up visions of The Walking Dead. Romero's picture was a stark, black and white, dead serious film with a surprising amount of gore. You see people eat intestines they ripped out of living people. It was the zombie movies that put Romero on the map, and it was the audiences that had a hunger for these zombie movies. I remember when I saw Dawn of the Dead, I tried to sit through it eating food to see how long that would last. I didn't last for eight minutes. And his impact on the face of horror is undeniable. Every once in a while, somebody has to come along that pushes the genre forward to the next step. And that's who George Romero is. This is the story of George A. Romero. While growing up on the East Coast, George Andrew Romero has many interests. I was born and raised in New York City in the Bronx. I grew up on EC comic books. I loved genre stuff. EC basically did one thing really good. It was always these revenge stories or the consequences. You know, it was always you, you pay for what you do. Now, one of the things that EC was really famous for was just having just great gold. The art was phenomenal. When I was old enough to go to movies by myself, they were rerunning the old famous monsters, uh, Universal films, Frankenstein, Dracula, and all that stuff. And so I got to see those big screen which were very, very impressive. They're beautiful films, big screen. Romero dreams of getting into filmmaking, but to him, this goal is beyond his reach. Like, I always loved movies, but I never thought it was anything that, that I could do. I thought you had to sort of be born royalty to get involved in it. As the years go by, Romero pursues other interests. Went to parochial schools in the Bronx, and then came to Pittsburgh to go to Carnegie Mellon University. And I did three years as a painting and design major. After college, Romero manages to take his first small step into the world of filmmaking. So after five years at CMU without graduating, I just sort of took off and stayed in Pittsburgh. In those days, cities the size of Pittsburgh had film laboratories because the news was on film. This was before videotape. So I started to just hang out at one of these labs and met the guys that were gluing together newsreels. And my first job was bicycling newsreels around to the TV stations. And then finally, I got my hands on a camera and we set up a little company to shoot commercials. And our first job wasn't really a commercial job. It was for Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Rather than leaving for Los Angeles to pursue his film career, Romero stays in Pittsburgh. I live here. <laughs> I don't, it's nothing necessarily about Pittsburgh. I mean, I stuck around. I found a town with a work ethic that has a lot of uh, diverse history, and yet that was sort of ragged around the edges. There's a certain despair that Pittsburgh has for me. It definitely is kind of a ghost town in a lot of ways, in that it had this big, giant industry, the steel industry that was there. And that's what everybody's job was. But they lost their industry. And you sort of get that sense of a city trying to, like, sort of wandering around, trying to find, you know, the zombies, trying to figure out what they're supposed to be doing. That idea of sort of this little bit of decay around the edges of what was an American dream has always been pretty interesting to me. After he has a few projects behind him, Romero and his partners decide to take their company to the next level. We had a commercial production company that was called The Latent Image. And some of us wanted to make a feature film and thought that we could do it. We were audacious enough to think that we could do something ourselves and raise enough local money to just get it together and try to do a little movie. I was just really impressed with him that he just, you know, he didn't wait for the system to, you know, to let him make a movie. He didn't even bother to move out to L.A. I had written a short story, which basically I ripped off from Richard Matheson's novel, I Am Legend, which is about the last man on Earth and vampires have taken over the planet. So I couldn't use vampires, because Richard did. And I wanted to sort of start it at the beginning on the very first night that it happened. So when we decided to try to make a little horror film, we said, well, let's convert that into a screenplay. So I started to write it. And 10 of us kicked in uh, 600 bucks a piece, and we actually started to go to work. He went out and got the financing. He made that with friends, and they filmed it. They did it on their own. As Romero begins his first feature, he has no idea that he's about to change the face of horror. 
They're coming to get you, Barbara. After establishing Image 10 Productions in the late 1960s, George A. Romero and his cohorts set off to produce their first feature film. The original title is Night of the Flesh Eaters, but it's later changed to Night of the Living Dead. We rented the farmhouse and we had cameras and lights and all that stuff in the company, so it was easy for us to just go out and shoot whenever we wanted to. It was a slow process and, you know, we were shooting jobs in between. And, uh, you know, we're just lucky that nobody got hurt. And all the actors lived through that whole extended period of time. And we finished it here at one of these labs in Pittsburgh. Literally finished it and then threw it in the trunk of the car and drove it to New York to see if anyone wanted to show it. Well, it first went out and it played neighborhood theaters, drive-in movies for four or five weeks. Night of the Living Dead makes a big impression on those who see it. This isn't like Dracula and the Wolfman and people with phony uh, European accents and cheap monster masks. This was a real thing. Horror had grown up. I slept with the light on after seeing Night of the Living Dead for the first time. It just paralyzed me with fear. Everybody that sees it, they remember the first time they saw the original Night of the Living Dead. He grabbed me! I think you should just calm down. It seemed real. I think more than anything, it seemed like it was really happening to these people. It had such a documentary feel to it. If you had a gun, shoot him in the head. That's a sure way to kill him. If you don't, get yourself a club or a torch. Beat him or burn him. The first time I saw it was one of George Romero's movies, it was, of course, Night of the Living Dead, like everybody else. And I saw it at a drive-in here in Los Angeles. It was so terrifying that my friend and I, in our car, could hear children inside other closed cars all around us screaming and begging to be taken home. It got really attacked by people like Roger Ebert, who basically said, how far will people go to make a buck? But Roger Ebert in Reader's Digest just castigated the thing. How dare anyone make something horrific? This is, you know, a new low in Hollywood horror films. They used to be so good, and now they're, they're so awful. And I thought, I gotta see this. People use Night of the Living Dead as a reason for needing an MPAA or some sort of a, a ratings board. Romero's picture was a stark, black and white, dead serious film with a surprising amount of gore. I mean, you'll see a little girl stab her mother to death with a trowel. You see people eat intestines they ripped out of living people. It was like nothing else anybody had ever seen. It was just a sudden stop and a sharp right turn in another direction for horror movies. The blood and the guts really has an impact on people. It's absolutely shocking to see some of this stuff. They're eating raw meat, pig intestines. I, I really think that Night of the Living Dead is a milestone from the standpoint of we've never seen blood and guts in a movie ever like that before. Many people also pick up on a deeper meaning behind the horror and gore. The thing that really separates Night of the Living Dead from other horror films of the period is, you know, the social subtext, the civil rights issues, the Vietnam War was fresh in people's minds. So the film had a, more of a weight to it. Even though the filmmakers didn't set out to make a, a message monster movie, a lot of this psychological baggage was kind of put on the, the film after it came out. Did you hear me when I told you they turned over our car? There's no racism on the surface between any of the characters. No one uses the N-word. No one says it. But you can feel the tension. You get the hell down in the cellar. You can be the boss down there. I'm boss up here. You bastards. So there's certainly a respect, and the respect actually comes from the filmmaker himself, George Romero. You know, it was that sign of the times, and we knew that we had injected some of that into the film, but it was more about the war and rioting in the streets. And the fact that we had an African-American in the lead was basically accident. Dwayne was the best actor from among our friends. I'll uh, drag you out there and beat you little things. Watch the door. 
because of the times, I think, and because of, you know, a lot of those factors, many of which were accidental, I think the film got a lot more attention than it would have otherwise. The black guy who's the lead, Dwayne Jones, you definitely observe a power struggle. But once everybody gets in the house and they're enclosed in the space, they're surrounded by the zombies, it becomes a power struggle. That's where things begin to go wrong. When you see these groups of the police and these volunteers, effectively these vigilantes, and you really get that sort of scary feeling that if this were a different movie, Dwayne Jones would have been lynched and not shot in the head. It's right there, just beneath the surface, making comments about racism in the South. Good shot. OK, he's dead. Let's go get him. That's another one for the fire. Night of the Living Dead is a minor financial success, but things are just getting started. Actually, we turned some money, somewhere between five and 600,000 bucks, and we thought it's over. But hey, we made a few bucks, and this is an easy business. So we were wrong on all counts. Light these torches over here. In the years following the 1968 release of Night of the Living Dead, Romero's film manages to make its way into Europe, where it gets a second wind. It sort of fell off the radar, and it was rediscovered in France. Uh, Cahiers du Cinema put a, wrote a huge piece about it, and then all of a sudden critics over here, like Rex Reed and several other writers, picked up on it and started to talk about it. And then it went into re-release again, then it started to play Midnight's. People started to use it as a midnight movie. And that's what got most of its attention. But this renewed success reveals a big oversight. In the meantime, uh, we, we found out, along with the rest of the world, that we didn't have a copyright on the film. We had put the little copyright bug on the actual title card, and that's where we have the copyright, which was wrong. We were just some guys in Pittsburgh making a movie. We didn't know. That's the disheartening thing about George, and he was an amazing, accomplished filmmaker, but I think maybe not the best businessman. So, no copyright on the movie. And it's just, that's how easy it was to just lose it. None of us noticed, nobody knew. One of those things that just slipped through the cracks. But that's the way it goes, the one that got away. And that movie has played somewhere every night since 1968. So, <laughs> Over the next few years, Romero goes on to direct an eclectic collection of movies, such as Martin and The Crazies. Camera. Roll it. Sound. Right, roll it. But it's his return to the zombie film that will elevate Romero's status to unimagined levels. The problem with a lot of the, let's say, the non-zombie related Romero movies, they never got big releases. It was the zombie movies that put Romero on the map and it was the audiences that had a hunger for these zombie movies. I got a call from Dario Argento, the Italian director, who was just a big fan of Night of the Living Dead. And he said, would you ever consider doing another one? And I said, I have an idea that might work. And he actually invited me to Rome and put me up in an apartment and said, you write, write. And I was there for about a month, and I wrote the script. That's how it happened. George Romero would not have gotten Dawn of the Dead made if not for Dario Argento, who helped secure the financing by pre-selling the international rights. Yes, it sounds complicated, but basically, Dario Argento, of course, is an amazing master horror filmmaker in his own right. The teaming up of them just got fans so excited. The name of this new zombie movie is Dawn of the Dead. Romero acquires a $1.5 million budget for his new film and shoots it in only four months. It hits theaters across the world in 1978 and goes on to earn more than $40 million. I think Dawn of the Dead is overall his best picture. A lot of people have made a great deal out of the satire in it, the consumerism. There's some of that, but nobody makes a movie like that to send a message. Romero is making Dawn of the Dead, and he thought, hey, let's comment on American consumerism while we're at it. Therefore, the movie isn't driven by the satirical elements, but they are certainly in there. You have these people who've locked themselves in a mall, and they have everything they could possibly desire. The finest food, they've got cars, they've got money, clothes, everything you could possibly want, and they're not happy. There's something missing in their lives. And that's brilliant. And thanks to a man named Tom Savini, Dawn of the Dead is gorier than ever. 
One of the things about Romero's picture is that he has not wanted to, but felt it incumbent upon himself to make each of the dead pictures a little gorier than the previous one because that's what the kids went for. And certainly Dawn of the Dead was extremely gory. George Romero had, had crossed another line. In awe of the sheer audacity of it. And so much of that is George's sensibilities. So much of that is Tom Savini's brilliant makeup effects. The movie starts playing, and right at the scene with the husband and wife hitting each other and him taking the bite, like, the whole place exploded, like, literally. With people throwing up in the aisles, leaving, running, just getting out of there. It was total chaos. Dawn of the Dead is one of the most profitable independent films in history. After its success, Romero has given bigger budgets for bigger movies, including Creepshow with Stephen King in 1982. But it doesn't take long for Romero to make another return to the world of zombies. Seven years after finishing Dawn of the Dead, George Romero gets to work on a third zombie film titled Day of the Dead. His original intentions are for a movie of epic proportions, but budget restrictions force him to compromise his vision. You never could have made that at the time it was shot. I mean, digital effects were not a reality. Armies of zombies fighting each other and countries defending each other with these armies of zombies, that could never have been not at the budget that Romero had. My challenge was to try to scale it down and see if I could just do it in, at three minutes. It's not my favorite of the trilogy at all. You know, had its moments that I really liked. I mean, I love Bob. <laughs> but a lot of the performances and stuff, it just seemed like, kind of seemed lost. Appointments in Day of the Dead was the fact that George's original script was absolutely brilliant. Most fans will tell you that Day of the Dead was a disappointment, but none of them, none of those fans blame George. They all blame the fact that really his budget was anemic. Day of the Dead is panned by critics and is a disappointment to fans. The film also performs poorly at the box office. Romero goes on to direct three more movies, then disappears from the Hollywood scene for eight years. I think the reason that George suffered a gap in his career is just not the best business person. I also think that he had trouble dealing with Hollywood. He's made all of his films independently, got independent financing, and he got to make things his way. Hollywood is just incredibly complex, horrible place to be creative and make a film, at least in the way that George likes to make a movie. But the cult following for Romero's zombie series keeps his name in the public eye. I have an original script from the movie. When I heard there was people coming, I bring everything with me just in case. <laughs> it's just amazing that there's that kind of passion for his movies. This should be my scene coming up right about here. <laughs> Dawn of the Dead is one of those movies that when you find somebody else who likes it, it's like you're part of a secret club. It's so funny how this whole cult of George Romero just sprung up. You've got fans that actually go to the mall where Dawn of the Dead was filmed, the Monroeville Mall. They wanted to be there at the shrine, as it were, so people could go there and they'd take pictures of each other shuffling around like zombies. Uh, I, I have people come in here every every year, all the time, looking. Oh, is this the place? It was. It was just me. Things look up for Romero when zombie movies see a resurgence. It seemed like that happened really fast. All these zombie movies are being made. Now there's been 28 Days Later, Dawn of the Dead, the remake. We never got to be zombies in our own films. I was too busy directing, and he didn't become a zombie in it. So it was great to be zombies in somebody else's film. It's got to be Romero. Renewed interest in zombie films leads to a green light for Romero's fourth zombie movie. In 2005, Universal Pictures releases Land of the Dead. The Land of the Dead, I tried to put some 9-11 and post-9-11 references in there without clobbering anybody over the head. His stories are so layered. He's not just making a horror movie just to spill a little bit of fake blood or to get a couple people's popcorn to fly up in there when they jump. I mean, he really has socially relevant things that he wants to talk about. And in the opening of the movie, as, as the Dead Reckoning is going through Uniontown and they, they start machine gunning, zombies one of the zombies gets shot and his head separates so we did a radio controlled head see the way the jaw has four-way movement so not only can it open and close but it can move side to side 
Romero fans are happy to see their favorite director back in the hot seat, doing what he does best. Well, I wouldn't call it a comeback. I mean, he never went away. George's got a lot of good movies left in him. George Romero continues to shoot in Pittsburgh because he knows where his roots are. It was wonderful to have a premiere here in, in Pittsburgh because there are so many people here that had so much to do with my early work. He's one of the first regional movie makers who stayed in his own town, made his own movies, and made his own mark there. George Romero is sort of the, the, the father figure to me of the entire independent film movement. Today, Night of the Living Dead can be found in the National Film Registry of the Library of Congress. And the cult following of George A. Romero is alive and well, eagerly awaiting his next offering. It's been fabulous. I mean, most of us are still working in the industry. I've had a fabulous career, mainly because of that film. So there's nothing to really, you know, moan about. I'm just learning all the way across the board. I feel like I'm still learning how to do it. Romero created this whole uh, subgenre, the modern zombie film. Romero changed the face of horror film. Just every once in a while, somebody has to come along that pushes the genre forward to the next step. He's the guy who, in the late 60s, pushed horror out of the 50s. And that's who George Romero is. He gave us the modern horror movie. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Wonderful.